Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. Welcome back to Creative Live. Welcome to Creative Live if it's your very first time here. I'm your host, Kenna Klosterman, and this is a new episode of Creative Live TV, or We Are Photographers, which is our podcast, video, and audio that connects you with photographers, filmmakers, industry greats all over the world. Uh, we talk about creativity, we talk about photography, we talk about life, what it means to be, the ups and downs of the creative uh, so that you know that you are not alone. Uh, I, before we get started, want to make sure that you let me know where it is that you're tuning in from. We are a community. Our guest uh, today is from Amsterdam. Can't wait to introduce him. Um, so we'd love to do shout outs and hear where you all are tuning in from. And we've already got people saying they're from, Sharia is from Melbourne. We have Lynn, who's from California, Larry, New York City, Tapia in Indiana, and Dirk in Belgium. So keep those coming, whether you're watching on Creative Lives Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitter, uh, or right here on Creative Live TV. You can click on the chat icon and join us there. So once again, everybody, welcome to Creative Live TV. Welcome to We Are Photographers. I am super excited to bring on today's guest, Richard Terborg. Richard is based in Amsterdam, and he is a professional photographer. He is a people photographer and loves connecting with people, whether that is through his portraiture, fine art, whether it is through fashion photography, um, you must check out his work. We'll talk about where to do that in a bit. He is an Ellen Chrome and Olympus ambassador. He has a love for teaching photography and um, after figuring out how it all works himself, loves to pass that along to other people. He is an exuberant um, person with tons of energy. His work has been uh, published in several magazines, whether that is from Vogue Netherlands, Digiphoto Pro, Digital Photography Magazine. And uh, he is not just a photographer, super involved in the worlds of art, fashion, music, loves the creative life. All right, everybody, it is time. Help me welcome Richard Terborg to Creative Live. Richard, how are you doing today? Yay, I'm doing okay. What an introduction, geez. <laughs> <laughs> no, we like to build build the hype, build it up. Uh, thank you, thank you. Especially for the first time on Creative Live. Hi, right, uh, there you is, go. Which is super cool, um, and we're just excited to to have you on. Uh, so, you. so Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, let's just start with a little bit of of background on you. I know you're not uh, originally from Amsterdam. Moved there when you were uh, young for schooling. So. Tell us where you're originally from, and um, we'll dive into that a little bit before getting into the world of photography. Awesome. Uh, well, I was born and raised on the island of Curaçao. That's a small island in the Caribbean, right off the coast of Venezuela, I think. Um, it's a small 60-kilometer island, and I lived there for the first 17 years of my life. And after, like, you do the normal high school kind of thing over there, you have to go to another country, preferably the Netherlands, because we have a Dutch passport. Um, to get like a higher education uh, over here. And that's pretty much what I did. Usually you go around when you're 18 because by then you're like allowed to sign contracts and things like that. But I kind of ran out when I was 17. I was like, okay, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And I came over here. <laughs> it's a small island. Um, and, and I know I've heard you talk about like that, you know, you got out at 17. You, what? What um, was it that you wanted to search for or find, or what were what were you looking to do? I think I think the 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 the, the creativity and the and the uh, uh, thinking of weird things, and especially as as a kid, I was kind of the the oddball out, right? Um, and, and as a teen as well, you kind of like listen to rock music, which is not very a local thing. And you wear the black makeup and you go for the gothic look, which is also not very a uh, local thing. So it's, it's uh, I had a kind of a different way of expressing myself, I guess. And it wasn't really how the island is or how the people there are. So to them, it's like very strange. So it felt very constricting, I guess, as, as, a, as a teen growing up to not be able to, I don't know, see things, do things. Uh, I, I felt ready for the world, but my age didn't say I was ready for the world, right? Something like that. <laughs> so That's super, was, yeah. Yeah, yeah That's so super interesting. Keep going, keep going. 
So that, that, that this was just a final sentence. But as soon as I left, that was like the release from uh, finally off the island and into a new world. And finally, my own world, something I get to dictate, like my own life and what I do every day. And I think that was like the biggest, like finally off <laughs> moment. I think that's, I mean, I think it's super interesting because you can see that um, same sort of the, the, in your work, sort of this, um, whether it's the storytelling, the dark, um, not just the dark, but the, the sort of, um, and not just the weird, but like just, <laughs> a, it's, it's very creative and like I said, cinematic or um, there's just a unique, I guess, or, or seeing a, a personality come out. And I'm I'm curious as to um, and we'll we'll jump around a bit back you know back to the like before photography, uh, but do you connect that with like who you are as as a person from that you know childhood slash or or how has that evolved over time um, with regard to like your style or the way you approach life perhaps. Uh, well, as I mean, as, as a teen, you're like, I was very rowdy and all over the place and wanted to do everything, right? And as I grew older, it kind of like more, became a little bit more relaxed. It became a little bit more uh, funneled into into what it needed to be. But it took a little while to understand. So starting as a photographer, I was I would just uh, do anything crazy, right? Do anything fun. Um, it was a time that that, that, that Flickr was, was 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 like pretty much the only social media we had for photographers. And um, I remember the homepage when you would load it up, it would have like little small thumbnails. I mean, it's very different now, but back in the day, it had like little small thumbnails. And it was kind of a battle to like get the most colorful, explosive, extraordinary thumbnail between all the other thumbnails to kind of... Uh, have other people see it, right? So if you would see flowers, 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 then you would see this weird character doing something. You'd be like, well, what's what's this guy doing over here? So for me, that, that was kind of like a push to do really weird shit, uh, really weird things. And um, I think over time, uh, um, uh, as I look back and, and, and really think about it, uh, I can see that it comes from, um, as a kid, I would, I would watch like a lot of movies with my dad and my grandparents. They would have like a satellite TV, which not it wasn't really normal for anybody over there right um so we would watch like movies from as a kid and my grandma and dad both like horror movies and, and very like um weird and it won't like take me away as a kid they would just let me sit there and watch with them like normal parents would like go no mine just let me sit there i mean it, it was like really old school horror so it wasn't really that bad but um, I think those kind of images kind of got stuck into my brain. And as I was able to create myself, that kind of the first few years that kind of like released out into trying to build something cinematic and and, and, and colorful and dark and, and, and crazy. That's super interesting because definitely like I have this, um, you, you do a lot of, or you've done a lot of self portraits. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's one that's you as the Joker, you know, or like <laughs> you and these like crazy, um, making yourself older or, mm -hmm. you know, all of these, um, all of these different looks and such. And so I can see how you as a kid, you know, you know watching horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of effect that had on the on Yeah, the, exactly, on exactly. The Especially when we're like impressionable as as younger kids. The uh, selfie thing um, was, was kind of interesting though, how, how that how that what got evolved. It was because I moved from Curacao to the Netherlands and my parents and my whole family still lived over there. They kind of gave me a camera and it was like, before our phones had cameras. It was like even before the word selfie existed, right? We had like these Nokia's 8-bit <laughs> playing what year? Snake. What year are we talking now? Uh, 2000, 2001. <laughs> so there we go. So around 2000 and 2001, I came here and I had like this little point and shoot. And it was the selfies were my parents asking me to send in like a report, like, you know, like, how are you doing? Show us your room. Where do you live? And it became like, like kind of a fun thing to like every week, I would send my parents like a little selfie but every week the selfie would get worse and worse and worse and worse. So I would put the point and shoot on my TV. The first selfie was like, hi mom, this is my room. The second selfie would be like five women in my room, a little bit of powder on my table going, everything is fine, mom, nothing's wrong. And then the other day I was like cooking. So everything's on fire. I would like blacken the wall. So it'd be like kind of like little snippets I would send my family just to give them like little updates that I was still doing fine and how like the living alone life would be like. And then finally, when eventually photography came into life, I kind of Kept, kept doing it just to test out lighting or test out a new camera or test out a new, but it was like these little things I would build just to kind of mess up my parents every week. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I think it's interesting. It's super interesting that that's, you know, like you mentioned, how you, part of how you learned lighting and storytelling and what have you. Um, and, and something that, again, you don't always need somebody else to be there in order to do. Um, so where are you, would you consider yourself a self-taught photographer? Uh, I am 100% self-taught photographer, at least in, in the photography sense, because I do have a degree in multimedia engineering, which is graphic design, audio design, video design. So I kind of learn composite, uh, com composition, um, coloring, color grading, um, how to work a mic, how to work a video camera. Those are like the basics I got at school. Uh, but photography, yeah, I had to kind of re relearn the things. Besides composition and color, there are different things you got to relearn for photography, definitely, yeah. But it's all self-taught. And so, like, what year are we in now? And what are you what are you doing? I know you sort of. <laughs> I, I've I've listened to some of the the other podcasts you've been on, and like your story is super interesting in terms of your mindset and uh, and this. Um, you were tell us about you were like in the IT world. Um, you were yeah. just kind of set that you're gonna do this thing in order to get to the goal of of what you want to do. So talk to us a little bit about that. Definitely. Um, so um, I finished my degree. I think I was done four years later. So I came in, I was 17. Four years later, I will be like 21, 22. We're talking about 2005. Um, I went to, I went back home um, just to relax. You know, like I finished school, I got my degrees. I went back home for like four months just to sit on the island and, and kind of hang out. And it's here when I noticed that I'm not kind of the person that will sit still and do nothing all day. I'm not kind of the relaxing type. So being there, I would like do little projects, do little gigs and help people out. But I would only help people out that um, I felt I could help and I felt the connection with. So if somebody would come with a bad attitude and go like, hey, build my logo for me. Here's a thousand euros. I'll be like, uh, yeah, I don't feel this. Go find somebody else. Because I was in the position to do that, right? I was living back with my parents for a few months. I didn't really need to pay rent. So I didn't really need the money. So here I noticed how cool it was to kind of um, work with people that you actually like and people that like you. So they come for something and you can help them. And that a project goes way smoother when you work with people that are kind of in the same mindset and going towards the same goal. So after doing that, I, I, I kind of figured out, well, um, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep, I want to keep being able to choose my clients. But before I do that, I want to put my diploma, my degree to work. So um, I came back to the Netherlands. I went working for, for, for a boss. Um, I did that for five years. And uh, the idea was like work for five years, set aside um, enough money every month so that in five years you can quit and I could do that thing again for another year. So I would kind of like give myself a five-year job, then a one-year break, then five-year job again, then one-year break. And that would kind of be my life. So that's what I figured out. Came back, worked the job. And as I was working the job, I kind of noticed Again, my boss was picking clients I didn't really like. Um, there were there were things I didn't like about being the job, and not only that, I've also noticed my uh, um, my own abilities, right? So I, I had like a really good job, right? I had a really good boss who who kind of found um, my extra abilities, my ADD, my my fast working, fast talking, and he would be like, okay, this computer is too slow for you. I'll just bring you another computer. So here's our two, and you can use this one, and when this one stops, you can work on this one, and when this one stops, I'll give you another one. So he would kind of like, I don't know how you call it, um, um, exercise the skill and kind of push it to its limits. And he would just give me more tasks and give me more responsibility. And I think in about a year, um, working there, I became his right-hand man. So I, I was pretty much um, helping running the company, talking to the design designers, talking to the coders, getting everything done. And it's then when I noticed, like, if I can do this for him, I could probably do this for myself as well. So in doing this, um, photography was always part of it. So the photography really started off then. I got my job. I bought my first DSLR. I bought it, like, very cheap. I think it was, like, a Canon Rebel, like, one of the first ones. Um, and I started learning photography. Every morning, going from work, going from home to work and work to home. And that little hour before work and a little hour after work, I would just photograph everything, um, come to work, offload my card, upload it to Flickr and kind of like had that extra computer where I would have Flickr all day and then my work on the other computer. And that's what pretty much what I was doing. And that's when the transition started happening in my mind as well, that it was possible to kind of do this for yourself, kind of um, um, if I could set the goal that I can work for five years, save enough to stop a year, Let's see if I can take that year and build a company to never ever have to at least work for somebody else and make my own decisions and decide um, to work with people I like. And that's pretty much what I did. I mean, I think it's it's interesting because it's definitely sort of a a, a 
something that a lot of people talk about. Um, you know, you're in a job that isn't necessarily satisfying. You know, maybe you are excelling at it. Uh, but it's not, like you said, what you truly want to be doing. And there's a difference between um, wanting to create, you know, portraits and create w photography and work as just your creative outlet. And it's another thing to see, okay, this is how I'm going to become an entrepreneur and live my life, spend my time. Yeah, and so an interesting layer into the <laughs> into the whole entrepreneurship but the fun thing about it was about in that time is um uh, i mean to mention names I, I i i grew up in the Flickr community with a renee robin with a benjamin von wong and all three of us and more um were, were kind of going into the same direction we all were in jobs we didn't like or we all doing gigs that we didn't like and in talking with these people and hearing a band go like, no, I'm quitting and I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm like, okay, well, if you're doing it, I, I, you know, I know I can do it as well. If we're communicating and we still kind of like swap out ideas, we can kind of grow together. There was no manual at the time for how to run a photography business because the old way of running a photography business didn't work. It was in the, in the housing bubble that crashed in 2008, where the market crashed in 2008 and 2007, 8, 9. That's around when we all quit and went full time. So there was no manual into how to kind of get this done. And to, so kind of having that community, kind of having people around you in the same gutter, I guess, in the same mud, um, you kind of like help each other out out of it. So what did you do? How did you, how, how, how did you start uh, surviving doing that <laughs> as, a, as uh, a full time? Yeah, well, I think, I think the first, the first step I, I always tell people as well is you got to know how much money you need every month, right? You need to know how much money, what is, what is, what is, what is, how much do you cost? What's the cost of living? And as like what at the time, I think it was a 26, 27 year old, I had no idea how much it costs to even live, right? So I took all my bills, I threw it all on a big pile and I started counting all the dollars and see how much it would come at the end. And at that time it was, let's say 900 bucks. So I needed 900 bucks a month to live off bare minimum. I'm just talking about rent, eating dry bread. Um, the bare minimum <laughs> would be 900 bucks. And anything above that would be like a little cheese on my dry bread. And everything more above that would be a little bit more. <laughs> so um, I started figuring out how do you, how do you charge, right? I started looking at other photographers. I see photographers charging $100 per session, $200 per session. Like the, 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 the normal going rate was around 200, 200, 100 to $100 um, dollars. Um, and I calculated that that could never, I could never do enough shoots and edit them and get them delivered in a month to make 900 bucks with a hundred dollar shoot. It will cost way too much time and way too much effort. So then I figured how much time do I need? How much time do I want to spend getting that money? And they usually say in the Caribbean that you're a little bit lazy because we're from the Caribbean and we usually sit on the trees and hang out all day. So I said, I wanted to work one day. I wanted to work one day to get that $800, $900. And that was my price from that day on. And I noticed that once you, you set something, the universe kind of like, if you really truly believe it's, it's, it's something you want, the universe will slowly get you into the position of receiving that money. So um, I started looking at um, where do people that have this kind of money hang out? Well, what do they do? Um, what are people that have this money in their pocket and they just go grocery shopping every day with 900 bucks, right? When I go, I'm like, can I have 900 bucks for a picture? They're like, 900, there's a thousand. I don't know why you want. So I was looking for those kind of people with that kind of mindset. And that's kind of how I, uh, I, I found them. I mean, this, this country has... Um, different cities where, where where really rich people live, different towns where really rich people live, and you can kind of hone your marketing to those spots. And not only that, as I was um, learning everything, learning my business, learning photography, I also started um, um, teaching people that didn't know yet or people that didn't understand yet. And that also slowly became a little revenue, a very, very small revenue, because I didn't want to make off money off of the people, off of the knowledge that I got myself. So I would ask very little just to get costs done and then go further. So there was like two things balancing, one, the photography part, and the other, um, reiterating what I learned to the photography community and see if that can reach the, you know, the, 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 the amount of money I needed to survive every month. Well, it, it's, yeah, I mean, good for you in terms of figuring out how to kind of reverse engineer 
There what it is that you need. Um, yeah. A lot of people, like you said, you first you start out and you're looking at what other people are doing, but that doesn't mean that it's actually working for them. And so, exactly. you know, that focus of what what do I need and where do I go, go find it? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about uh, continuing on on that mindset uh, because you, I've again, I've heard you talk about this sort of, it was, you know, before The Secret came out, you know, or, or <laughs> the, that, you know, movie film, but the concept of um, not just like putting something out there and it will happen, but really setting an intention and then without having to know how it's going to come to life, uh, but then being able to navigate that. So are there other, uh, talk to me about that concept or, or where that came from in you or, um, or, or uh, is that something that you still, uh, still your sort of mindset as you, as you look at creating your life? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, it's a mindset that I, I, I've always had and, and always kind of been, been inside me. Um, um, what I've noticed, and I've noticed it within myself, and I think that's something I kind of, um, I try to stop doing myself first before I notice it in other people as well, is that my biggest hurdle all the time, my biggest hurdle was my own brain. It was my own brain trying to stop me, telling me I'm not good enough, telling me um, you shouldn't be doing this, telling me there are people way better than you that, 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 that already do this, right? Who am I to teach other people photography and I'm just learning photography, right? Um, so. I've noticed that that's the biggest hurdle. But once you kind of jump over that, I mean, and you put that workshop out there, and the first person that signs up was actually a photographer I looked to very, very much. He's like, his name is Roderick Dracorudio. I mean, he signed up and I'm like, what? Why are you signing up? I mean, I should come to your workshop. You shouldn't sign up to my workshop. I got nothing to tell you. And he said like, no, no, I'm, I'm coming because I want to know how you're doing it, right? What, what, what it is that you are doing. And I think there that I noticed that it was my own brain kind of building something that um, I needed to get over. And I stopped doing it, or at least I tried to stop doing it every time um, from that day on. And this is what I noticed in a lot of people as well. Like you can, you want to do something, but then you find a lot of excuses why you shouldn't or why you, you don't. And I'm kind of the guy that takes away the excuses. It's like, stop those excuses. Just take the plunge, see what happens, right? What's the worst that can happen if you just try it. And that's kind of the thing I always go back to. Like, as soon as I get to that point, like, okay, so what's the worst that can happen? I could, I don't know, I could lose a reputation I don't have. I could, I don't know, lose all the money I don't have anyway. So there's nothing to lose, right? Take the jump, try it. And you'll notice that once you even consider jumping and you're already kind of off the ledge, people already kind of jump with you. There are like more people standing next to you going like, oh, he's, he's jumping. We can jump up. Let's go. We're all, and then you kind of jump together. So it's, it's kind of, uh, yeah. Try to put off your own brain that is stopping you and, 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 and try to like do the things that you actually want to do. Say the things that you actually want to say. Um, don't apologize for feeling the way you feel, right? Just do, feel, jump, live, and try it. See what happens. <laughs> it's, I mean, uh, that um, intensely resonates with me uh, in, in terms of just it's, we get so... I get so stuck in my head, and I'm sure a lot of people out there feel the same way. And, and so it's, um, it's just this, like, it's so easy to look at somebody else again, and just it, that imposter syndrome or that, that like what they're doing it, how, you know, mm -hmm. and, and not to like take that first step. Um, I think it's interesting that you talk about, there's about the community aspect. Um, and, and again, I know that you're, you're definitely a, a people person, uh, whether that's your photography itself or strategically maybe i don't know is it strategic in terms of the the networking the the growing community like originally let's let's not forget i'm a programmer and a designer right so originally i'm like a nerd sitting behind a computer that doesn't like humans and a gothic who would better be sitting in a corner depressed and not talk to anybody so i am not the kind of very open guy that i turned out to be eventually it started strategically it started as um I built a person I wanted to be, but I wasn't that person yet. But I could play that person as an actor. I mean, coming back to the whole movie parts, right? So I would I would put on that mask of that person that I wanted to be, and outside I could play that person 
um, two humans, right? I would play the happy guy, I would play the jolly guy. And when I come home, I'll be like, oh my God, I can't put me in a corner. There's no place like home, right? I would like totally crash down. And over the years, it becomes easier and easier and easier. And at some point, it just kind of turns into you. So slowly, you become that person you want to be versus um, the person that you are at that moment. So I think it's that. It's kind of like building a character of a person I wanted to be and morphing into that. And what you just said, said about like um, the imposter syndrome and looking at other people, um, stop looking at other people. Make friends, talk to your friends, don't look at their work, don't talk about their work, just talk to people, live with people, and stop looking at other people's work. I stopped looking, I stopped scrolling Facebook, stopped scrolling Instagram, and it helps a lot. What about that helps? Um, one, it's uh, like for, for, for one, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid, but um, I like being influenced by artists, but I don't like being influenced by other photographers because you can get a very, you know, that you're making something that's, that's some, already, somebody else already made. So that's why I like the music industry, the art industry, the, the, the creative industry, because that's where I get sparks from other kind of industries. Um, that scrolling around just gave me more and more imposter syndrome. And not only that, besides that, it costs a lot of time just scrolling. Instead of scrolling, <laughs> think of the person you want to be. Think of the next fun thing you want to do. Think of the thing that annoys you about yourself right now and try and change that instead of scrolling on a platform that wants you to keep scrolling. <laughs> Yes, they, yes, they do. <laughs> it, it, it's um, again, it's this like mindset. Um, and does it take discipline? It 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 takes a certain. It, it definitely takes a certain discipline. Especially now, when I talk to a lot of people who have a hard time doing it, I understand now that um, maybe to me it came a little easier. I don't know if it came easier. I mean, I think it came just as hard. But I can abruptly stop doing something and do something else. I don't, I don't, I'm a cold turkey kind of guy, right? So I just stop something and I go. And I know that like I'm not, career. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. You stop, you jump and you see what happens, right? So it's the same with the thing. And that might be, that might work well for me. I mean, other people need to find out what works for them. And maybe you need to like, you know, tone it down a little bit. Start with seeing how much time you do spend on those apps, right? There are enough applications that will show you how much time you will spend on Instagram. And maybe that will slowly change your mind into how much time you're spending on it and how much time you could better be spending doing something more interesting and fun. Let's go back to, uh, to photography and and teaching it the aspects of you know of you're learning 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 and and often it's like often you teach what you most need to learn or what you most want to learn because you're spending so much time learning it that then you're like oh it, 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 and the act of figuring out how to teach something is actually again continuing to to hone in on your own craft yeah. uh, so uh, it was it what was it about for you um, that you wanted to kind of pass on? Was it, is it, was it the lighting? Is it the, I mean, you teach it, workshops was, in, talk to me about the different types of things that you love yeah, to yeah. teach. Uh, well, back in the day when, when I first started out, I was one of the very first to um, use a lot of color gels. I mean, don't get me wrong, there were more people doing it, but now there's a lot more people doing it. But back in the day, there were not many people because I was building, I was taking it off of uh, movie sets, right? I was looking at movie sets, movie behind the scenes, and using their kind of CTO gels and CTB gels to create like a kind of setting. And I had like a lot of people around me asking me like, how do you do that? And then what's, what's the trick to that? And I'm like, it's very easy to me. I mean, <laughs> how do you not do that? You just put a lot. I mean, it's it's easy, right? So that's how it kind of like transformed into me um, teaching it. And it all went with like, I mean, uh, falling down and getting up again, of course, because the first time I thought, I don't think anybody learned anything, <laughs> learned anything. But that um, after every class I teach, I learn what I can do better. And as soon as I'm done teaching, I get home and I write what I can do better. So that next time when I teach, I can reread what I did wrong the last time and then slowly improve and improve and improve. That being said, both my parents were teachers. So I do come from like a kind of teaching background, <laughs> teaching background. And that also might be a big part of why um, I kind of jumped into it and, and started doing it because it's somewhere in the DNA, I guess, uh, of explaining things. Right, right. But I think that's, uh, it's a, such a good like note, note to self when something doesn't go as you ho as well or or you know and maybe it's you telling yourself that anyway but as you wish 
like writing down what that was so that instead of just saying like, oh, I'm, you know, yeah. I messed up, you know, like, okay, how do I learn? How do I and, learn? And don't, and don't wait a day. Don't wait five days. Like get it on paper as soon as possible because you will forget it. And the next time you won't do it again. But if you constantly keep doing it, you can also backtrack back to your first workshops and see if, if you've actually improved on, on what you wanted to improve. So you're, a lot of your your portraits, um, you create this great, this amazing sense of of emotion, connection, um, intensity, uh, and you know you can see that in your own self portraits. So I think it's interesting that you can connect with yourself <laughs> in like in a intense way that allows other people to to do that. Um, because there's just a lot of like you look at some of these self portraits and you're just like zoom, into Richard, you know, <laughs> or, or or the persona that yeah. you're creating in character in that those images. So that's one thing, like being able to show that of yourself. But talk to me about how you approach, and I want to talk about two different avenues, like approach creating portraits, connecting with people. Uh, for sort of your own work, portfolio building, side projects, and then for client work, because I can imagine those are two very, potentially very different approaches. So maybe start with the creating of your own work and um, how you how you approach, because I think that's one of the hardest things for a lot of people is how do I work with people? Like even if I've mastered my photography stuff, like how do I work with people? Yeah. Uh, I think I think this 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 come working with people comes down to what I learned going back um, home for those few months, that learning that um, um, working with people that I like. So I try to. Um, how do you find people that you like? Well, you work with as much as possible, <laughs> and then you kind of stripe off the ones that you don't like, and you keep like a little pot of people that you do like. So for me, it first started off with I need to build a team, right? So I like to shoot fashion, I like to shoot people, and that means you need a makeup artist, you need a stylist, and I didn't want to like find a new one every other day. I wanted to find people that I could actually work with. Um, so I hopped onto things like uh, Model Mayhem or, or Purple Port or websites like that, and I put out a casting call. And I see who would react, and I would send messages to people, trying to get, get trying to get a feel to how somebody is. I think a lot of people um, lose um, lose how you, how you call that. I think it, it's your little internal radar. Um, when, when when somebody says something you don't like, um, you tend to keep trying to convince that person to like you versus listening to that radar and just going like, no, we're not going to work. We can be friends, but it's not going to work together. And I think I kind of like learned how to hone into that because I used to be like, everybody needs to like me. Why don't you like me? What's wrong? What did I do? What can I do better to, for you to like me as well? Trying to please every client, trying to please everyone you try to work with, right? Um, I was that guy as well. But then you notice that you're pleasing the wrong people, the people that are sucking more energy or taking more out of it or um, wanting more without giving more, right? Um, so it's like, um, first you got to find people that work together, that, that you can work with good. And for me, that was makeup artists through Model Mayhem and just going through them all, paying them and see which one works. And the ones that stuck are still with me for, I think, at least 10 years now. And we're still creating together. Um, getting a, a model. Um, when I work together with my team, because they're kind of my same energy, it's a whole lot of party. It's like a big party with music and food. Like we all like food. I'm like a sucker for food. Um, and my, I, I had like a big studio. I've had a lot of studios, but in the last four years I moved my studio inside my living room um, because it was a kitchen in there and coming from the Caribbean we kind of like soul food and what would you guys call soul food this is how I connect my team together and I connect my clients together and I connect my workshop people everybody that comes in me I feed we talk we have a party and then we go shoot so I build a connection first with the person and once we go shooting I can we can you kind of you mirror each other right so I can kind of give the energy that I want and they will tra they will kind of pick over that energy from me. So that's kind of how I do it with like, I guess my own projects. We start off trying to get in the same mindset, trying to get into the same connection, trying to get into the same brain. And then we do the thing that we do. Or by now, I mean, we've been doing it for 10, 15 years now. By now, the same people, I've been working with the same people for 10 years. So now when we come in the studio, it's just, we go. There's no there's no connection needed. We just party, we hit, we I do click once. We're like, we got it, let's go home, cool, fun. Let's go do something else. So that's how it goes now, but that's how it built up. And the thing is, 
I kind of translated the same way of working to my clients, to my workshop attendees, to everybody. When a client comes in here, um, they're not a client to me. You're the same as my makeup artist that I've worked with for 10 years. You're like, hi, welcome, come, what can I cook for you? I got this, I got that. Start eating, what are we doing? What's your favorite music? Let's start putting music on, right? So I try to get that connection um, as fast as possible. And that's all based off of my energy. So. I built that character with that energy that kind of put people's guards down or, or, or at least get me where I want them to be. And I tend to ask a lot of weird questions apparently, but people answer them. <laughs> people answer them. I don't know why. <laughs> but, can, can you share some of those questions? <laughs> Or do I not want to ask? That? <laughs> it's a studio. It's mostly with a lot of women, and they talk about boys and sex and <laughs> everything else, food. <laughs> no, I don't have. A, I mean, it's it's usually personal questions, right? It's who are you, where are you from, and 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 why why do you get here? And then I try to find something that I've experienced as well in their story. So something that has a connection, and I go like, hey, I've. I've experienced exactly what you're saying. I felt this and this and this and this and this. And like, oh yes, I felt this. And that's when I have the connection. And then I can go, okay, cool. Now we can shoot because I got you. We're, we're one. <laughs> and most of my clients are my friends. I can call them all up. Yeah. Well, so I'm hearing like it's the it's the creating an environment that is comfortable, um, that brings the energy together. That um, and then. Yeah, get, uh, allowing people to be become vulnerable, but then uh, by asking these questions, but then sort of again making them comfortable because you're relating to them to them in that way. So that's sort of the it, the people part, right? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we are photographers, and let's not forget the only thing we do is push a button. We don't, we're not helping people here. We're not keeping people alive. We're not medics. We're like a luxury commodity to a certain people. So when people come. They just want to have a good time, right? They want to have fun. They want to forget about their day, forget about that the kids were screaming on their way over here or or whatever. And that's why I try to create like a bubble where all that just fades away when you come in and it's just a release of fun and, 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 and something else, right? Do you think that that is, again, is that what people um, therefore sort of come to you for is, is even that the experience in addition to the images themselves? <laughs> a little bit, yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some people come for me and not for the pictures, but yeah. No, it's, it, I, think, I think it's that, yeah, definitely. But it's, like I said, it's, that, that, that's what I wanted, right? This is what I've built my brand, my company um, um, to be. I used to sit in the office just like these people, right? I didn't like where I was sitting. I didn't like, and if I were to book somebody or give somebody a lot of money for, for, for a shoot, I would just want to have fun and, and, and don't be like, okay, oh, you got to sit here, wear a white shirt, stand like this, click, go over here. Okay, you can find your prints over there, go find your prints and you can pay at, over there and see you next week, right? I didn't want that very sturdy. I wanted, I mean, I chose this job because it was, I, I can do what I want and I wanted to create that environment with, have the people think that same way when they come into my studio, they can do whatever the hell they want. If they want to sleep, dance on this sofa, do whatever, go have fun. <laughs> it's all you. <laughs> yeah. Has that ever not worked? Uh, I mean, wait, wait, let's talk about some. Let's talk about some of the 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 challenges because you know part of me is like, oh, that sounds like a ton of fun, it, it, which it is. Uh -huh. But like, what are some of the challenges that you've had maintaining this, or um, you know, have there been moments where it's like, I don't know if this is gonna work, or is it just like keep going, keep going, keep going? Yeah, I mean, there, there are enough moments where you think it's not, it's, it's, it's going to work, especially if you keep going, keep going, keep going. I mean, I've been into burnouts. I've had a burnout um, a few years ago, I think five, six years ago. And that came from the keeping going. And I didn't understand the burnout because I was doing what I liked. I was working with fun people. Why was I exhausted and I couldn't work anymore? Um, and and I think that, that it all came down to... Um, 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 Again, the imposter syndrome, it came down to um, um, every time I would go to the studio, I would, I, I kind of, I have to psych myself up. And in doing that, I would raise my heart rate and raise my muscle tension. I mean, it would relax once the people are there, but in doing that, I think that's still something I'm, I'm still struggling with um, because it's, after so many years, the character I play um, is me, but it's also not me. 
it's still a character I created. It's still a person I want to be completely, but you can't 100% be the happy guy and nothing's the matter. And there's that's not how life works, right? You can be happy maybe 10% of the time and the rest, we're all kind of depressed sitting in our home. No, there are a lot of challenges um, to, to this and for me as well. So uh, the money challenge as well. I mean, there are times where um, there, there are no clients that, that are booking me. And again, Every time I get to a point like that, it's my own brain keeping me there, right? So clients aren't booking me, but it's probably because I'm depressed and I'm not showing myself online or I'm not doing the marketing or because I'm laying in bed a little longer. Um, and as soon as I kind of pull myself out of that, I notice that everything starts going again. So there's a, I call it strong self-survival pulling myself out of situations. Um, which, which doesn't mean I, I won't be in it, right? I, I can be depressed for six months at a time and, and not move and, and just keep going deeper and deeper. Everybody has those kind of periods. So it's not happy all the time. It's not um, going all the time. It's happy with my clients. I'm getting energy off of people that give the energy as well. So trying to get the negativity out as much as possible. Um, I think ah, th th that's, yeah. That's part of the biggest struggles and not being happy with your own work, right? I mean, I have days where I, I, I know I can do a certain lighting, but it just doesn't go. I cannot drop my energy or let the client notice that this is the case, right? So I do have to keep the energy up. So in my brain, it's like a double struggle of getting the happy guy out from, hey, I'm fine. And in my brain, I'm going like, ah, where is this? Why isn't this not working? So it's kind of like that balance that that's kind of hard every now and then. <laughs> Well, I, and that's just kind of why I why I ask these questions, and and because I think it's really important to for everybody who's watching and viewing or listening. Like, yeah, we have this like one one brain over here saying something, and this other brain over here saying something, and um, and that's that's normal and natural. And um, you know, I could be saying that to myself right now. You know, yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's just it's. You know, we, we are humans and I think, you know, many of us who are living this creative life, you know, maybe it becomes even more extreme at times or can, or what have you. Can, you can you can accept a little bit that it's that it that it, that it's part of it. I mean, you don't have to accept that you feel miserable, but you can accept that it's a wave that comes and goes, right? You won't stay miserable forever. It will eventually be an up again. And I think this is where I'm slowly trying to get my brain in and to like accept that those feelings are natural. You can feel this way, feel this way, it's fine. There will be ups as there are downs. Just go through it and there will be light at the end. The way out is through. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> my, um, my best friend and I always talk about. Um, and uh, so let's talk about cre creating narratives um, and you know, again, you, you, there are certain uh, images that are, um, you know, you and a person and, and, you know, just a, a plain backdrop. And then there are images that you create that are story um, in, in one image, which is different. Like you talked about, you're studying multimedia and, and, and Those so the, the, the two brains that are yeah. fighting each other, <gasps> one yeah. is very explosive, very colorful. <laughs> so what goes into like take me into creating a a, a story and a narrative and a scene for for one image like how does that work for you or how do you teach people to that or maybe that's like the <laughs> yeah, same true true um it's, it's, it's the same exactly um there are different ways to get an idea and if you um if you this guy called John Cleese, he's the um, a writer for Monty Python, and you should look him up on creativity. He gives like a lot of lectures about creativity because he needs to. He had to create a show every week and be very creative about it every week. Um, so there are multiple way, multiple uh, uh, ways to creativity and creating. One is you can get up one day and you can have a bright idea, right? It's it's so clear as daylight. You know exactly what you want to do, and those days are amazing, but they're very few <laughs> than the days where you have to force it out. So days where you wake up with an idea, go write it down, run with it, do it, get it down on paper so you can actually do it, get it down in detail. That's what I do. I get up, I write. Um, how cool would it be to have a girl in a room where it rains water and she has like a black umbrella and the whole room just rains water and you have like just one light on this. So I would describe it as much as I can what I wanted to create. 
Then there are other days where a client calls me 12 o'clock at night and they go like, Richard, I want to shoot tomorrow, 8 o'clock, and I'm calling you because you're creative. Think of something. These are the details we have. It's a dress. It's red. Good luck. I'll see you tomorrow at 8. And around then, <laughs> that means you have to force it out. <laughs> and there is kind of a way that you can force it out. Um, I, I learned this back in school as well. It, it's pretty much brainstorming or brain mapping. Um, you write on a piece of paper, you write a location, you write a color, you write a, a prop, uh, uh, you write a, a theme or a style, and you fill in what you have and you try to fill in the rest what you don't have. You just let your brain run wild. It takes like two seconds. So you write, let's say, a location. I take Amsterdam Central Station, my bedroom, or maybe the client already has the studio defined. Then it's the studio. Um, color. I would go like red, blue, orange. Just on the top of my head, I would give it three seconds and write three sentences, or the client would have dictated this already and said, we have a red dress or we have a blue dress. So that means we have studio, red dress. Then we have a style. Is it vintage? Is it 50s? Is it fashion? Where are we going for? And in writing this all down and getting the prop as well, does she have a knife or a balloon? Are we going to work with a hat? Are we going to work with scissors? Having the prop, the location, I take out two of these words, or I write down three words for every category, for the location, for the prop, um, for the style. I take out two words and I keep one word. So uh, you'll have a guy in a red suit standing at Amsterdam Central Station holding a knife. And then my brain automatically starts creating a picture for that. So I give my brain like a sentence and the brain kind of translates the sentence to an image. And when you're a creative and you're working through photography, this works automatically. It doesn't matter who, if I give somebody a sentence like that, uh, a, a dark guy with a big afro, with a 60s bell bottom, with a knife in his hand, standing at a train station, everybody can kind of create an image based off of those words in their head. And then that's how I force creativity and I go shoot that. Wow, that's that's <laughs> super awesome because I hope you guys were taking notes right there because I mean it is this um going back to like a discipline or uh you know, having a system in place for yourself to be creative. I think a lot of like you said earlier a lot of times we think we have to just ideas are going to come from wherever. <laughs> um, and those are good days. Those are amazing those are good, days. <laughs> yes, those are good too, but <laughs> Often, um, and I've found, you know, by talking to to creatives, you know, over over the years, is, you know, sometimes that giving yourself these constraints oh, yeah. actually allows you um, to um, to be more creative. This is exactly what I teach people. Like constraint <laughs> is the best thing that happened to my creativity. It's 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 ah. exactly that. It's exactly that. Um, we always have a lot of. If you have a lot of ideas, you don't know what to grab. You don't know what to take. I mean, there's so many things I can do. I don't know what to do. And giving yourself that constraint, giving yourself a color, a theme, a style, giving yourself that one thing, and then going wild on that one thing, you will have a way more honed in idea of what you're doing and what you're trying to create. Definitely, I love, yeah, that's, the people are right. <laughs> Anybody who's had constraints <laughs> was right. <laughs> what are you most excited about working on right now? I mean, we're now, I, I will let everybody know, you know, we are, it's it's uh, Monday, March 15th, 2021. <laughs> yeah, okay, I wanna talk about Mondays in a second, but um, it's, we're still in, um, a you know, pandemic. We're still in, it's been an incredibly challenging year for anybody and everybody in all the ways. Uh, but what are, what are you most excited about working on right now? And how have you been sort of managing through all of this? Um, well, the first few weeks was hard, at least the first month was hard when like everything closed down and we were ready to go to conventions and all the conventions were ready because March is like convention season in Europe. So we were all ready to go. And, and I mean, that, that bummed me down for a month. Um, and that was fine too. Uh, but afterwards, um, I never got so much free time, I guess. So my brain was like, oh, I got to make lists of whatever the hell I wanted to <laughs> wound up not doing anything. That's fine. But, um, because of the free time, I, I could finally uh, um, breathe and think about hobbies. I mean, there's been a while since I've had hobbies because I've been doing this photography thing, and it's a hobby and a job. But um, so getting in the free time, I would, I, I would just give myself the time to be free as well, mostly because I'm a working photographer. Secondly, the first thing I did was what was still possible? Within what constraints could I still do something? 
And because I was locked into my city, we weren't allowed to like leave cities or they wouldn't want people to leave cities. I started looking at my local city and what was happening and what were people doing and who was still moving, who was still doing something. And I found this blog, um, Avanti, I worked with them before, um, and they really started picking up um, um, new projects. They said like, okay, now it's COVID, we're gonna do COVID stories. We need like a photographer to run out to interesting people who live in the city and see what they are doing, right? What, how, they did, how, this, how did this change their lives and what are they doing now? So I think for the first year, I think up until a few months ago, I was like running around my city, photographing very, very interesting people, um, doing interesting stuff, like the inventor of the air fryer, there's a Dutch guy living in my city who's the inventor of an air of the air fryer, the air fryer. I was like, how how do you live in my city? How, what? Where do you come from? So it, it was an interesting way to meet new people. And when everybody was locked up, I w I would I was meeting interesting and fun people. So to me, the first um, year kind of went by very fast. Still seeing people. I mean, keeping distance, of course, with all the masks and everything. Um, but I got very excited about that. And besides that, I also started looking at my city council, what, what they were doing. Because of the pandemic, I saw they were kind of um, um, rebuilding the city because there's nobody there. They were kind of um, revamping the city, putting in new, new tiles and, and cleaning up everything because there was nobody there to be in the way. Um, so I contacted the, the city council as well, asking like, what are you guys doing? Is there anything that needs pictures or photographing? And they were like, oh yeah, we're, we're rebuilding everything. Could you do like a before, uh, during construction and an after construction? I'm like, oh, for sure. So th those two, between those two gigs, I was just bicycling around and driving around my, my, my city and, and trying to find people. And that's still kind of a little bit what I'm doing now. Besides that, like I said, I was also looking at my hobbies, which one of them is cooking. I, I really love cooking and cooking Caribbean food as well. So I started combining the cooking with photography as well, which I've never done before. So I started taking my Caribbean recipes from my mom, my, mom, my grandmother. And um, my mom is a little bit of a bad, I mean, an annoying bastard. But um, every time I ask my mom for a recipe, she doesn't send me the recipe. She sends me like pictures of what the recipe should be. So she sends me like um, I ask her for like a bean recipe. She has, like she has this lovely bean recipe. So I tell my mom, "What's the bean recipe?" And she sends me a pictures of like the beans in a pot, a tomato, and like a, a onion. I'm like, "Mom, <laughs> this doesn't taste like a tomato and an onion and a bean. You put why do you what what's the recipe?" She's like, "This," and they just grab some spices and you know it's fine. So. Um, the way my mom sends me those things, that's how I photographed. Um, I started photographing my, 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 my local dishes as well. So I made like a little still life of recipes from my mom and my grandma of just the ingredients and not showing how to put the ingredients together as a little tribute to my mom, little, you know, bastard for not telling me how those things were. But it was also her way of teaching me how to cook, right? And, and making me fall in love with cooking as well because she wouldn't give me the recipe. She would just give me the ingredients and I had to figure it out. I can't go to her. It's like an eight hour flight to my mom. So I had to like figure out what that taste was. And this is also where my love of cooking uh, kind of came in. Super interesting, because again, there there is your mom putting constraints around <laughs> you, <laughs> like here you go, Richard. Like, you want the recipe? Out. Good luck. <laughs> and and yet that is, uh, you know, listening to all of your stories, like that is what you do, and that has allowed you to do what you do is you figure it out, uh, and and you know, not everybody ha can allows themselves to you know that trust or whatever that they're going to be able to figure out and start taking the steps to do so. Um, it's Monday. Tell us about, we're, we're, fil we're filming on a Monday. Talk, it's talk Monday. To us, yeah, talk to us about your Monday thing. <laughs> My Monday thing. It's not a Monday thing anymore as much as it was back in the day, but yeah, no, that all started as a, as a joke. Um, I think 10 years ago when I was, uh, when I just started out, I would come onto Facebook and Instagram every Monday and everybody would just be depressed and like, oh my God, it's Monday. We got to go again. And in order to like change that around, I figured like I'll start celebrating Monday because I can finally start. I can do that thing I wanted to do. It's the fun week. I mean, I love my job. Let's go. And if you don't try something else, right, quit your job, go do something else. So it, so it kind of became a thing to every Monday morning around 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m. I would like start like a screaming post with like explanation marks going, Monday, let's go. And over the years, it kind of evolved, and now everybody's happy on a Monday. So now, when I open my mon my Facebook or Instagram on a Monday, like everybody's like, "Yay, it's Monday!" And like, see, I like changed my whole Facebook to a happy Monday instead of a sad Monday, <laughs> and that was kind of it. 
Well, it goes, it goes back to mindset. And, and even if you're not, um, stoked that it's Monday, you know, like you said, like you said earlier, when you're, when you are creating this persona of like putting out there what you want it to be. And eventually then you become that because you believe that. And, you know, and so it, it, do, do you still, I mean, it's Monday. Like it is, <laughs> is, is that still a celebratory thing for you? Um, within me, yes. I just stopped doing the post. So I, I would do like a post every Monday. And I've done that, I think, for eight years straight every Monday. So you can imagine how many posts that were. And I would have like an inspirational quote with them uh, on every post as well, trying to help people out or whatever. And I think about last year, uh, I didn't really stop. It just wound down a little bit to every other week. Or, But the funny thing is, Every time I don't, I get messages in my inbox, people going, Monday, Richard, where's your post, Richard? I'm waiting. It's Monday. Where are you? Are you sleeping? So it's not, I don't have to wake people up anymore. They pick me up now, right? So if Monday I feel bad or I don't want to, I just have to open my face. My voice like, Richard, where are you? It's Monday. I'm like, ah, ah, yeah, it's Monday. Let's go. And I get like, you know, to pick me up. So yeah, it's still a thing, kind of. That's awesome. That's awesome. Because again, it just, it's such a great lesson in, the power of community, the power of um, just uh, of yeah, just just being okay yeah. with what where what you're feeling that day, and then allowing these you know allowing whether it's you supporting people or people supporting you, uh, it's um, it's just a, it's a really great lesson all around. The world is funner <laughs> with cool people around you and. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what you've been able to create and and continue to create and and thrive, and that's you know what I what I what I love learning about, seeing about with you, you know, you and your work. Just the the again the taking taking ideas and and putting them out there uh, and, and and making it a real thing, um, whether how crazy it is or how you know or how. Um, not crazy it is uh, that it just um it, it's it's just super cool to to see and watch and find out um i want to give a shout out to, to dave uh dave sulsana who's saying whoop whoop monday so <laughs> see it's starting already there's a chain yep, reaction <laughs> yep he's one of your one of your mondays there you um, go love it uh, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your inspiration, your stories, your just your your mindset and and approach to creativity and life in general. Where can people find you, follow you, see the workshops you're creating, tutorials, all the things? Um, okay. I, I know right now it's kind of tough to say, come, you know, take a class yeah. with you in person, uh, <laughs> but that would. That that will happen again. Um, so, what are what are all the ways that people can connect with you? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It was a, it was really super fun to to, to meet you and, and have this talk. Um, you can find me at richardtherborg.com. Um, you can mm -hmm. Google me or uh, just type in my website, and we'll have all the socials. It's my name, Richard Terborg, on everything: Instagram, Facebook. Um, yeah, come join the party. <laughs> uh <laughs> Awesome. And and again, we'll have those links in the show notes and uh, so that people can, can truly connect. And obviously you, again, um, you are a giving person as well in terms of sharing knowledge as you're, you know, we learn and we share and we learn as we are teaching, um, which is which is also a beautiful thing. Um, so I want to thank everybody. I'm looking over here, thanking everybody who has has tuned in. Um, we've got Dirk. We have uh, Adinda who is saying, "I love your Monday thing. Positive vibes everywhere." <laughs> we have uh, Mekbeeb who has been tuning in from Ethiopia, oh, which no is way. awesome. Thank That's you for awesome. tuning in. Uh, Chana in Israel. We have Fred in Austin, Texas. Um, so again, on. Ontario. Thank you guys all for tuning in Thank and um, be sure to connect with Richard. And once again, this has been another episode of our podcast. We are photographers. You can subscribe, rate and review anywhere it is that you get your podcasts. We have a library of over a hundred episodes um, where you can, again, connect with amazing people like Richard here. And you can do that at creativelive.com slash podcast as well. 
And if you are tuning in on creativelive.com slash TV, check out the upcoming schedule of events that we have going on. And of course, there's always something for you to learn here on Creative Live 24 seven, um, connecting with that global audience. So that's it for today, but thank you all again. And thank you, Richard. It's thank been you a pleasure. Much. Pleasure was all mine. Pursuing creativity is arguably the most practical thing that you can do. We humans are adaptation champions. That's what makes us human, our ability to imagine. The hard part is to look inside and say, what are my invisible beliefs that I have about money? I wanted to figure out how it actually worked. And you are really here because you became passionate about an idea. What does it take to capture great photographs of birds? You have to be grounded in your cameras. You need to understand the technology. Just like any band shoot, we're looking to capture great shots of the band themselves playing on stage. So the drummer shot, lead singer, guitars. How do you even prepare to shoot with your phone? And then we're actually gonna go into the edit. Once you hit rock bottom, there's no place to go but up. You learn what, what's real. You learn what's needed. In astrophotography, there is a great deal more planning involved because you are literally shooting in the dark. We can't change others, but we can change our perspective. Wow, that's a good way to start the day. I had tears in my eyes. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So, essentially we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10, or 15 hours of great content, but now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours.